Well, hello, folks. This is Dom Flemons, the American Songster, and this is Season 4 of the American Songster Radio, Episode 2, and this is one on Black Dylan covers. I'm here with my co-host, Vania Kennard, my wonderful wife and co-producer of American Songster Radio, and... On this podcast version, we're going to go a little bit deeper into why I picked the songs and a little bit about my cover of Guess I'm Doing Fine. So uh, let's welcome Vania to the program. Thanks for being here, Vania. Hey, hey, it's so great to be here. And um, yeah, this is going to be a really awesome episode because we're going to dig a little bit deeper into Bob Dylan's career and his influence on a lot of the African-American artists who are in the Roots Music community. But, um, you know, you have a great story of how you were first introduced to Bob Dylan. So it would be great to just talk a little bit more about that with you. Yeah, well, you know, my introduce- introduction to Bob Dylan came when I saw the documentary, actually the Quincy Jones uh, produced documentary, The History of Rock and Roll. And on one of the episodes, um, I think it was episode number three or four, it was called Plugging In, and it talked about the 60s folk revival going on in New York City and in the Northeast in the earlier part of the 60s, and the episode itself transitions itself into um, the movement going out west to San Francisco and how just sort of the hippie generation took on the ideals of the folk revival and moved them into the psychedelic rock movement that came out of the late 60s. So through that, I started getting Bob Dylan crazy. And at the time, it was before digital remastering had happened with a lot of Dylan's records. So I was able to get them for less money than other records at the time. So it, it made, I became a fan, and then I became a super fan as I began to find all of these wonderful records that he had produced. Nice. Well, one of the first times I ever heard Bob Dylan's music was actually in my music class in middle school. Um, I had a teacher over there who loved all of the different folk songs, and um, his favorite was actually Buddy Holly. <laughs> he got <laughs> big into folk songs and rock and roll. Um, you know, artists like Buddy Holly and uh, Jimi Hendrix. And I just remember him playing, I believe it was Blown in the Wind. And, you know, as a seventh grader, we had to learn the lyrics. So <laughs> that was something that... Um, I remember being my very first introduction to his music, but it really wasn't until I was working on President Obama's campaign back in 2012 that a lot of my friends started playing some of his music just casually, you know, sure. just as we're hanging out, they're all playing, yeah. you know, Tambourine Man or um, anything from Blonde on Blonde. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I met you, though, you, like, showed me her record collection. was like, oh, you want to see my Bob Dylan section? Let me pull it out right now, you know? Well, you know, the thing about Bob Dylan, he's put up 39 studio records since 1962. And it, one of those things, now a lot of his songs are sort of in the music curriculum. And so, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's interesting to see the way that people's perception of Bob Dylan's music has continued to evolve over time. But for me, I've just been a Stone Cold fan, and even before they made the Bootleg series, I was finding bootleg recordings of Bob Dylan that happened to be around in the atmosphere. And then in the early years of the internet, I then started to collect a lot of the the live performances from early parts of Bob Dylan's career, as well as some of the studio recordings that were around. Um, and, and I just... Uh, found just something so fascinating in the way that he wrote. I like the way that his songwriting is put together, and it's very poetic, which is something that people think about often when they think of Bob Dylan's music. Nice. And, uh, well, you actually got a chance to see him in concert, right, with Paul Simon? Like, when you were, what, 16, 17 Yeah, around years old? 17 years old, uh, my aunt bought me a ticket to go see Paul Simon and Bob Dylan in concert in 1999, and that really blew me away. It was, it was awesome to see both of those legends in concert, and to say that I had had a chance to see Bob Dylan live was something that was of great importance to me. I had one other time I got to see him over at the the Coliseum over in uh, in Phoenix, and so I ran around the floor with a bunch of other people trying to get up close to Dylan, and we never got to him, but uh, <laughs> uh, we tried to get a closer seat from from the nosebleeds. Uh, but yeah, you know, with that as well, just the trajectory of this artist um, has always fascinated me. From a fellow who left Minnesota and went to New York City and became a part of the folk community, then rose to the ranks of being one of the most highly regarded songwriters, then becoming a rock and roll artist in the mid-60s, finding a burnout point, and then making even 
more personal and introspective art into the 70s, leading into a born-again Christian era in the late 70s, going into the 80s. And then he even does a Madonna-styled pop album in 1985, Empire Burlesque. And then he goes (laughs) into doing the Traveling Wilburys, which was a super group of he, Roy Orbison, George Harrison, and Tom Petty. And then that's around when he makes the album Oh Mercy with Daniel Lenoir, who... um, he would have a continued relationship. And then in the 80, late 80s, he made a bunch of records that are just okay. And then in the early 1990s, he sort of comes back with these two strong acoustic solo records. First in time in his career since the early 60s. And they're great. Uh, Good As I've Been To You, World Gone Wrong, excellent albums. And then he continued to plow ahead. And by the late 90s, he put out the album Time Out of Mind, which now is actually going through the Bootleg Series Volume 17. It's Some of the outtakes from Time Out of Mind um, are a part of it. But one of the things that's so interesting about Dylan as a recording artist is that he experimented with form, style, tempos, keys, chord changes for lyrics all over the place. So even many times in his career, Dylan didn't even have to follow any of his own Dylan rules, which can be sometimes aggravating to his fans because he follows his own beat. But what's interesting about the Black Dylan cover subject in, a, in of itself is that you take Bob Dylan out of the picture, his artistry, take it out of the picture, and you have a song left. And the sign of a great cover of a song is when an artist can revamp it and reimagine it so that it's something completely different from the original, but it's just as brilliant. We think about songs like Proud Mary. The original version by John Fogarty, Creedence Clearwater Revival, has a very country rock edge, Mm -hmm. but then when it was interpreted by the Ike and uh, Tina Turner Review, the song turns into a whole different... uh, structure form and everything yeah you know i'm glad that you brought that up too because one of um the best parts of his you know music career is the songwriting yeah and um the lyrics and the poetry and the images that he brings to life and you know the first song we play during the broadcast is she belongs to me and the line she wears an egyptian ring it sparkles before before she speaks she's a hypnotist collector you are a walking antique brilliant what else can i say i love the fact that you brought that line up because that's my favorite (laughs) line in all of it um and there's something and even in live versions you hear dylan say she wears an egyptian red ring so the ring is red when he was singing it in the the time after he released re-released the album so at at different times dylan has is also free form improvising like a jazz performer in the interpretation of his own lyrics of course people see this now when they go see dylan nowadays they'll see his songs rearranged in so many different fashions that some fans are aggravated i don't want to i want to hear like the record but dylan has been uh has been steadfast in 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 keeping his creative juices flowing and it's it's beautiful and yeah well you know i'm glad you mentioned that too because um when i think about that line specifically it reminds me of memories from my past where mm. my grandmother actually gave me an egyptian ring wow and it had two ram's heads on it Wow. And um, it didn't sparkle. <laughs> it should have sparkled. Only but, after um, you speak, not before, though. You know. Exactly. But um, this sort of idea that you're a walking antique, I feel like that kind of describes you in a way. You yeah, know, maybe. We, we've been collecting antiques for a long time, and we have a lot of great things that we've um, collected over many years. So even within those specific choices and words, I felt like that was very relatable. Absolutely. And I mean, and the theme even continues forward into the last verse of salute her when her birthday comes, you know, bow down to her on Sunday and salute her when her birthday comes, Follow, uh, Halloween by her a trumpet and for Christmas, get her a drum. You know, it's a, it's one of the things that really has allowed Bob Dylan to be a, a, a fully enduring artist, even up to the, the modern era. And of course, when revisiting some of these African-American covers, to know that Billy Preston is recording this song maybe five years after it was released. Mm -hmm. George Harrison, who has always been a great friend of Bob Dylan, produces his uh, Billy Preston's record, and they select this song. And structure-wise, they add a chorus into it, because like this song doesn't have a chorus. It's just verse after verse after verse with no chorus. I noticed that. But even for Billy Preston, to fit the form, 
and the gospel style that Billy Preston sang, they have to have an, a break or an interlude. So they do, she belongs to me, which actually mm-hmm. which actually never appears in this entire song, which is also brilliant about the The actual line, she belongs to me, never says that line at all. Hmm. But So they had to put that in, she belongs to me. Ooh. Nice. And they love gospel choirs. And, and 1970s was the <laughs> black gospel choir uh, uh, era. Well, a lot of gospel artists covered Bob Dylan, you know, including the McCrary sisters. Yeah, Mavis Staples. Mavis Staples. And uh, a, lot of different, a lot of different artists, you know. Uh, if folks ever want to hear what Pop Staples sounds like when he's playing a song like Masters of War, go ahead and check it out. I couldn't fit it on this episode, but, uh, I mean, any number of artists have covered... Yeah, sometimes very surprising songs by Bob Dylan. Yeah, and, and not just gospel, but country music artists have also covered a lot of Bob Dylan songs. Um, and also R&B artists like The Persuasions. Of course, you yes. Know, and, and the song The Man in Me. And actually, on that particular lyric, one of my favorite lines is, It takes a woman like you to get through to the man in me. Mm-hmm. Storm clouds are raging all around my door. I think to myself, I might not take it anymore. Take a woman like your kind to find the man in me. Yeah, and I mean, the man in me is such an amazing number. Of course, it it comes from a slightly obscure Dylan number, New Morning, which is one of his early 70s records that I've always loved. He's actually doing a lot of piano compared to guitar on it. Mm. And so the songs have this very piano balladeer vibe to them and so with it's funny with uh, the man in me though it, that song got its own revival when the movie the big lebowski came out because oh, it's yeah. actually the opening theme to the big lebowski and every time the dude you know everybody who's seen the movie the every time the dude gets knocked out the, the song uh does la 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 which is mm-hmm. dylan dylan singing the man in me What's great though is see the persuasions. You even got me hip to uh, a a um, a sample that was taken from one of the persuasions records. Good times. You were telling me what what song was that? Were the good times? Oh, it was. It must have been a hip hop artist that was doing it. I can't remember right now. But yeah, I, but, I, there's a lot of sampling of of different lyrics that goes both within the R&B and country music canon, and a lot of them dip into Bob Dylan's music, too. Well, and, and it's interesting with the Persuasions, they were always a group that was an a cappella doo group. And in the early 70s, uh, you know, doo had its heyday between, like, the 1955 or late 1940s, if you include groups like the Ink Spots and, and the Mills Brothers as, as doo a lot of doo-wop became very popular in the mid-1950s up until maybe 1960 or 61. Mm-hmm. So the Persuasions, they were a throwback group that did a cappella uh, songs of contemporary artists. So people could hear that style with them, of course, with a Jerry Lawson, uh, the the lead singer. He he would sit with the group and they would uh, record the songs. They also did albums of All Grateful Dead. Uh, all Beatles, great version of Don't Let Me Down. But for The Man and Me, they just bring this whole other quality. Because again, you have to imagine, um, Bob Dylan is a, uh, a a fellow that is of Jewish heritage from Minnesota. And just to hear the way that these African-American artists, and particularly with the Persuasions, four black men singing the song The Man and Me, it's interesting to hear how the lyrics can morph and change when you just hear a performer uh, performing. Again, nothing wrong with Bob Dylan, but uh, again, to be able to see the interpretation and reimagining of a lyric, that's what this whole episode's been about. Yeah, and, and Sam Cooke does a great job at that, too. Another you know, perfect example. With his version of Blowing in the Wind and the moment where he sings Yes and How Many Times times must a man look up before he can see the sky and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry obviously i can't sing as good as sam cook so i'm just gonna read the lyrics but when you hear his version of it he really puts all the passion behind those lines and um it's just it's so beautiful to hear his style within um the context of bob dylan's lyrics well you know one thing that makes dylan a phenomenon kind of like the beatles in a way he came in at a time where most songs were written by tin pan alley songwriters and um there most songs were written by tin pan alley songwriters and you would have a songwriter pitch a song to a musician Mm-hmm. And that's what they call A and R, artist and repertoire. Mm-hmm. And then that popular artist would record a song, and then that would be how everybody would win: the publishing company, the artist, the management, and all the infrastructure. Easiest way to 
think about this is think of a Christmas album. You know, when someone does a Christmas record, they, they rarely write all of the songs. And if you do any Christmas material, just like Bob Dylan did a Christmas album a few years back, worth looking up, um, Must Be Santa is the one I would recommend the most. Nice. But, um, <laughs> you know, there are... There are publishing people pitching material. So Bob Dylan comes in and he's writing all the songs, performing all the songs, and then getting the publishing off of all the songs. So it was a new business model when he began to write all of his own material compared to doing the traditional music that he had been, uh, he had gotten famous for doing early on in his years in New York City. So Blown in the Wind, for example, um, this became a anthem for the civil rights era, and people like Sam Cooke helped to galvanize. Dylan as an important songwriter because of the, their covers. And the fact that he did it at the Copacabana shows how Sam Cooke was also becoming more conscious for the social causes of civil rights. Blown in the Wind is a great example. A Change is Gonna Come, which was his own song. I think in some ways, Blown in the Wind allowed Sam Cooke to be able to um, expand his voice. And then, of course, Bob Dylan has referenced uh, everybody in soul music from Smokey Robinson to Sam Cooke as being an influence on him as well. So there is an open dialogue that's happening between lyricists, melodies and music, and the artists who decide to record the songs. Well, and that's the interesting thing about Bob Dylan's career as well, is that not only is he influenced by blues artists and R&B and country artists, but he's also contemporary to a lot of them, too. Um, you know, Muddy Waters being slightly older mm -hmm. and um, just being a part of like the folk scene and getting a chance to meet Woody Guthrie, getting exactly. a chance to meet Pete Seeger. So he also had the opportunity to live in that same time period where all the great folk singers sure. and blues singers were um, still producing music and still out there playing. So he really had the best of both worlds. And I think that put him at an advantage when it came to his songwriting because um, he was at the perfect place in time. It's like when you think about being a music musician or an artist, you always want to be on the right path musically and to find that inspiration. And so the fact that he got a chance to not only have a lot of great friends who were prominent musicians, um, but also he was mentored by artists who have influenced all the major pop stars since you know the past few decades so you know bob dylan's career definitely um comes around full circle with the network of people who he surrounded himself with and um you know another another lyric that i want to talk about too is um from the song what good am i and the line that says what good am i if i know and don't do if i see and don't say if I look right through you, if I turn a deaf ear to the thundering sky, what good am I? And um, yeah, there's there's so much poetry behind the songs, and there's a lot of ways that you can interpret it and um, apply it to your own life in many aspects. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, you know, what good am I, to me, in some ways, I feel like is a, a sequel to Blown in the Wind, lyrically. It speaks about a lot of the themes of of uh, being passive in situations where you know that you have to be more active. You can't just turn a blind eye to some things. And Blown in the Wind talks about that. And of course, Guess I'm Doing Fine is also a song lyrically that, that reaches into that sort of... Um, that sort of headspace. And and you got to think about it as well. This is why I picked a couple of songs that were from albums completely dedicated to Bob Dylan. Like, for example, Odetta Sings, The Songs of Bob Dylan is, is one album. Uh, Betty Lovett's Things Have Changed. And again, you have to imagine, 50 years apart almost for each of these albums, but there are these powerful moments um, that these particular African-American women brought into the lyric and the performance of Bob Dylan's words and lyrics uh, that are just amazing. I mean, and it, and it really, again, I can't overemphasize how re revising and changing the songs are a big theme of all of these. Because if you were to take a, a playlist and use the original Bob Dylan tracks, you will have a very different sounding mm -hmm. playlist just by the nature of the, the way that these artists have changed the material around and well yeah I, I totally feel you on that and you know as a black woman myself seeing that other black women were inspired um, enough to perform his songs and then um, adapt them into something new and modern that kind of fits their own perspective 
I thought that was actually really empowering because a lot of times black women feel like, um, you know, they have to express themselves in their own unique way. But the fact that Bob Dylan could write a song that a black woman could sing passionately like Betty LeVette, I think that's just amazing. And that just, that shows you that he's truly a legend. You know, yeah. that's, that's what... That's what powerful songwriters do. And, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about um, all of the different aspects of his songwriting because you also um, were able to incorporate his new song, Guess I'm Doing Fine, into Traveling Wildfire. So I'd love to just kind of pivot into the new album and why you chose that specific song. Absolutely, and and I will just mention in one final word, it's it's also really beautiful the the juxtaposition between artists who are contemporary or who knew Bob Dylan on this on this particular episode, compared to artists who recorded the songs way afterwards. So mm -hmm. I, I tried to get a good mix of the time periods in which these songs were recorded, as well as the time periods of the original recording. So you can hear some of the different voices of Bob Dylan through the decades. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Guess I'm Doing Fine. That's that one of the reasons I picked Long Time Gone from Odetta off of her record, Bob Dylan Sings, uh, Odetta Sings Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. is that that's another one that comes from the same series of publishing demos. So just to kind of give the small version of how you would describe publishing demos, when a songwriter writes a song, many times with their publishing company, especially in the old days, they would cut an acetate recording. You mentioned Buddy Holly before. Buddy Holly was doing this as well. Cut an acetate, and then you'd send it to the publisher. The publisher would tell you that they want to publish the song. And then you would they would send the acetate off to artists that they thought the song might you know interest uh, right. pique their they think they'd wonder if the song would pique their artist interest and so because um Albert Grossman was managing both Odetta and Bob Dylan I'm sure there was a connection there for that album oh okay but so you have Bob Dylan cutting publishing demos and he doesn't necessarily use every song that he's published um on a record it may not fit and bob dylan's always been a sort of artist that he's been pretty steadfast on 10 songs i think on i think that's his was his thing like 10 to 12 songs nothing else and so the guy's thrown away just as many gems as he's as he has kept gems on the record and even with dylan fans it's it's one of those things where it's half and half in between. So the Whitmark demos are a special series of demos because there's about six songs that were never recorded on commercial records. So Long Time Gone was one of them, and the other one was Guess I'm Doing Fine, and then a couple of other ones. But Guess I'm Doing Fine, I've always loved that song. It just has a powerful uh, set of lyrics. I mean, I've never had, I ain't never had much money, but I still get around somehow. Many times I've bended, but I ain't never yet bowed. So hey, hey, I guess I'm doing fine. I mean, lines like that, are so great or the the one about the stones cutting my face um my road it might be rocky the stones might cut my face but some folks ain't got no road at all they just have to stand in the same old place i mean what an amazing series of lyrics it also this song sort of reaches into a period of time when dylan is breaking away from straight topical and socially political songs mm -hmm. and moving into introspection talking about the self and how the self can be uh um, how how one's own self can be its own uh, expression of freedom. Yeah, well, I, I totally feel you on that, especially with Guess I'm Doing Fine. Actually, the opening line, which says, well, I ain't got my childhood or friends I once did know, um, but I still got my voice left and I'll carry it anywhere I go. For me, that's one of the most powerful lyrics in this whole song, um, because it reminds me of how I grew up. You know, I grew up in the military with my dad being in the Navy and we traveled so much. We literally didn't live in the same place for more than like three years. So part of my childhood kind of feels, you know, gone. Like I ain't got my childhood no more. You know, once we left and moved to a new place, that was it. We started over and, um, but I, I feel like I've always still had my voice and and um, that was a huge part of my life is just carrying my story with me, even though I felt like my childhood wasn't um, something that just was there, like how other people lived in the same place all the time. I didn't, you know, and so um, 
you know, I carry, I carry my voice everywhere that I go and, um, you know, guess I'm doing fine too. And, and the story of overcoming struggles and life changes definitely resonated with me. And so I'm so glad that you picked this song and, um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about how it was in the studio with producer Ted Hutt making this one. Well, I'll just mention, uh, a few things about the very wonderful theme that you brought out of Guess I'm Doing Fine. There's another song that sort of dovetails from this period of Dylan's writing called Bob Dylan's Dream. And the last one, because it's basically he's riding on a train going west, and he's thinking about friends he used to know, and they used to hang out a bunch. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, um, after he sits and sees the cold night when they all had to split and part from each other, he said, How many a year has passed and gone? Many a gamble has been lost and won. And many a road taken by many a first friend, and each one I've never seen again. I wish, I wish, I wish in vain that I could simply sit in that room again. Ten thousand dollars at the drop of a hat. I'd give it all gladly if our lives could be like that. Nice. And just thinking about those times when you're with close friends. And this one also says, I ain't got no childhood. So it's like the baggage of childhood is not on me. Mm -hmm. but I'm going forward. And that's one of the things that is very powerful about this particular song is that it's always about moving forward. Well, and in the studio, you know, you and Ted Hutt reimagined this to be a bluegrass number featuring um, Sam Bush, who actually is playing fiddle. He's known for his mandolin playing. So stylistically, um, how was the song originally done by Bob Dylan? And um, how did you decide to modify it for the new album, Traveling Wildfire, including the instruments on there. Well, with Guess I'm Doing Fine, that's originally a song that was recorded on guitar with vocal, and it's just a very simple recording of Bob Dylan at the tape recorder. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to emphasize a little bit of Piedmont blues in the arrangement of Guess I'm Doing Fine. So I came up with that guitar lick that I'm playing during the, in the intro section, and then I didn't really want to change much else structurally, but I found that because it is a mostly a two-chord song with an occasional third chord and a, maybe a little bit of a fourth chord in there, it was a song that it felt like an old-time bluegrass number in one way. And so I decided to phrase all of the words sort of like thinking about someone like a Lester Flat or something like that. Ain't got my childhood friends I once did know. Mm -hmm. I got my voice and cared anywhere I go. So it's sort of like a a little bit of a, a little crooning type of thing at the end that's a part of uh, something I like about Lester Flat. And when I started to mess with it, you know, first we just threw the whole kitchen sink. I, I made a little homemade string band from myself playing banjo and guitar and harmonica. I don't think we use the harmonica, but I use the rhythm bones, the bass drum. And I just knew it needed a melody. Because at first I, I tried it on the harmonica, but it sounded too much like a Dylan tune with harmonica. So I thought to myself, who could I get to play fiddle? And then it hit me. I did a gig years ago with Sam Bush over at Rocky Grass in Colorado. And I was fortunate to catch he and Del McCurry doing a duo set. And at that particular year, they... um. At Sam Bush and Del McCurry, I mean, of course, they decided to practice in the green room. And so I just sat there and heard them play. And one of the songs they played, uh, Del McCurry would pick up the five string banjo and Sam would pick up the fiddle. First time I heard Sam playing that fiddle, I, I knew it was a very distinctive sound. And I just knew that was going to be what I needed to have on this record. And so but once I called Sam up, he told me some great stories about um, hanging out with, at the Grand Ole Opry with some of the old timers there. And yeah, we had a big time with it. So we had to do that one remotely. But I mean, talk about moving forward. Sam is just driving this thing in just the he's best way. He's playing super fast, Phil. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's like whipping it up so fast. And, and your voice stays like so like chill and mellow yeah. so i feel like it's such a great balance between the song and we even sat down and we figured out all of the ways that the verses would go ted and i first did it and we wrote it out and so when we recorded it we wanted to have some breaks some verses to be longer than others and so sam was so kind so kind to be able to uh, look at my little write out of the of the of the song so that we could find these beautiful little pieces and you know he does these great little trills on the violin and on the fiddle um, where he's just 
lifting up. He's singing the background. He's doing the harmonies and just some great stuff. So when I heard his part come back, I thought it was uh, I thought it was just just beautiful, and it, it's a great way to end out the words to Traveling Wildfire because of course Songster Revival finishes the album out. But I was glad to see, kind of go full circle and bring a little bit of that Bob Dylan uh, sound into my into my sound on Traveling Wildfire. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because when you think of yourself as being like a 16-year-old standing in this like giant stadium and Paul Simon's on the stage and Bob Dylan's on the stage, are you thinking to yourself, oh man, like when I'm 40 years old, I'm definitely going to be recording a song of Bob Dylan in a studio in LA with a top level producer and, um, you know, talking about this on WSM radio, it's like, it's so mind blowing how much of life has changed since you were younger and how far you've come. And I feel like Guess I'm Doing Fine is like one of those songs that says, hey, I went through so much in my life. I had so many things that happened, went right, went wrong, had different directions that life took me on on this incredible journey. And the fact that I'm still standing is like a testament to, yeah, I guess I'm doing fine, everyone. Like, yep. you know, I hit some hard times. I might have hit rock bottom a couple of times, but the world still keeps on turning. Bob Dylan still keeps on cranking out great music. And <laughs> here we are today. Yeah, I mean, that's a, uh, that's a beautiful thing about about Bob Dylan's music. I've always just really reson it's always really resonated with me and i'm glad that i'm able to put this one on on traveling wildfire because um just i I just really really enjoy the writing and the poetry of of bob dylan especially that era that 1963 to 1966 um sort of run of songs that he made were just just beautiful and so i'm glad that it's a it's a testament to where I've been, where I've gone, and also when asking them, it was wonderful that it was suggested from the man upstairs, Bob Dylan, you know? Yeah, and you know, even I think about how much society has changed over the past couple of years, and I think about how many obstacles we've faced as a country and how many global challenges that have been going on with all the different wars and um, political tension happening out there. And th- one of the lines, and I guess I'm doing fine, says, and I never had no army to jump at my command. No, I ain't no, never had no army to jump at my command, but I don't need no army as long as I've got one good friend. So, hey, hey, guess I'm doing fine. And I just think about how many people have struggled over the past couple years and over the decades and generations. And a lot of people didn't have you know, armies or long, large groups of people to come to their defense. They had to overcome obstacles on their own. And so, you know, this song is definitely a testament to the resilience of people who have um, faced all sorts of obstacles, whether it's been natural disasters, war crimes, um, people who have fled their countries and are refugees. I mean, you know, all of this has so many different symbolisms that you can kind of think about. And to me, every time I, I meditate on on how far my life has come, I, I think about, you know, at the end of the day, I guess I'm doing fine. Like so many people are struggling out there in the world and, and we can all kind of be there for one another and have empathy towards one another's um experiences absolutely and of course that is one way that bob dylan's music has been used as as a as a means to express bigger ideas of of um social um social consciousness um social uplift as well as being just um fine expressions of the human condition but let's like let's flip flip around a little bit though because bob dylan's music isn't all topical there are a lot of um songs that are about love and like, for example, Just Like a Woman in its own type of way is about the war of love. And even at the end, uh, where he mentions that, um, and when we meet again, introduced as friends, please don't let on that you knew me when I was hungry and it was your world. Um, that's the type of um, deep emotional relationship that uh, Bob Dylan has with the music when it comes to lovers and and when it comes to um, the other person in that love affair. And so he has a lot of songs like that. Also, I just kind of wanted to mention a few things, just that since we have um, 
a little bit of the list, I want to mention a couple of interesting Dylan, um, Dylan, uh, I'll say, appearances. Um, many, many people may not know that in 1986, he appeared on a track from Curtis Blow. So look up Street, <laughs> <laughs> look up street Rock oh, by nice. Curtis Blow, 1986, and you'll get a little bit of Dylan right on that intro. Um, we've got, in 2003... The album gonna change. Uh, it got. Uh, this in 2003. Uh, the gospel songs of Bob Dylan, "Gotta Serve Somebody," came out, and uh, Dylan has this interesting appearance with uh, Mavis Staples for the song "Gonna Change My Way of Thinking" from 1979. Slow train coming. But what ends up happening is Dylan's playing the song. He knocks on the door, and then he calls Mavis in, and they actually recreate the entire dialogue of the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers in Texas from 1931. They don't say nothing about it. It's a weird inside joke, but that's the type of stuff Dylan does. <laughs> then in 2003, he did his own movie, Masked and Anonymous, which has, again, some very, very interesting twists and turns, and it even features Richie Havens playing the great Tombstone Blues on uh, that movie, Masked and Anonymous. I'll mention in passing the album Tangled Up in Blues, where I got Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson's uh, wonderful version of Pledging My Time. This is from the Ain't No, Tri Ain't no Tribute series put out by the House of Blues, and they had their own record label imprint in the late 90s. And this features blues artists covering uh, well-known rock acts, and you know mostly it's acts that always referenced back to the blues, like Bob Dylan. And I just want to mention a few other notable performances of black artists on this album. We used uh, Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson, but Taj Mahal does a great version of It Takes a Lot to Laugh, But It Takes a, a Train to Cry. Mavis Staples does Gotta Serve Somebody. Isaac Hayes sings Lay, Lady, Lay. R.O. Burnside sings Everything is Broken. And, of course, my good friend Alvin Youngblood Hart sings Million Miles. Um, and then one other, art, uh, one other um, bit I'll mention will be uh, the 30th anniversary concert in which Richie Havens plays Just Like a Woman. You can also hear some really wonderful versions of songs from black artists, such as Stevie Wonder singing Blown in the Wind, his own version, Tracy Chapman singing The Times Are Changing, and the OJs doing their wonderful hit version of Dylan's song Emotionally Yours, backed by Booker T. Jones. So that's a little bit of that. Yeah, well, that's, that's a lot to take in. And, <laughs> you know, we need to do like a part two of this episode just so that we can kind of curate some more um great bob dylan songs but for the sake of time you know we should really wrap up just by you know thinking about the ways that bob dylan's lyrics have not only personally inspired us but have inspired you know decades of um generations who have grown up with his music too so i'm just so glad that you've curated this wonderful playlist and it's been really fun to talk about it with you today. Well, thanks so much, everybody. And thank you, Vania, for being here and being a wonderful co-host on American Songster Radio Season 4. And yeah, folks, uh, if you send in your comments and you want to do another Bob Dylan episode, I'm more than happy. I've only scratched the surface. There's hundreds of these Bob Dylan covers that are just amazing. And if you want more of them, let me know. We'll do another episode. So with that out further ado, we're going to have to end out. So thank you all again for listening to American Songster Radio Season 4.